So those two models, the moore coulomb model and the Hogue-Brown model, again, were only dependent upon sigma-1 and sigma-3. It's almost as if sigma-2 didn't, didn't matter. The, 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 the uh, intermediate principle stress didn't even matter in those models. So an example of a model where it does matter would be this laid model, okay? So now the laid model is a function of the first and third invariance of the stress, okay? So the invariance of the stress, they're called invariance because these, these, we know that the stress tensor changes when you have a change of coordinate system, right? So if we were to rotate the coordinate system, uh, you'd have a different individual values in the stress tensor. But these invariants don't change. So that's why they're convenient to use for constituent models, because they're frame independent. So in other words, if I take this, the trace of any stress tensor, it's always going to be the same, uh, independent of a coordinate system. I don't mean to say any stress tensor. I mean to say, if I take a, a stress tensor and compute its trace, and then I do a rotation and compute its trace, they're going to get the, the sum is going to be the same value. Okay, so that's the first invariant. The third invariant is the uh, the, the product of the eigenvalues or the determinant. Right? So, the laid criterion was originally developed for materials without cohesion, so granular soils. And so more recently, there's been a modification of that to make it more useful for you know, true rocks. And th also that includes the effect of pore pressure. Okay? And so this is called the modified lay criterion. The, basically, the M in the, other, in the other model, which M was just a fitting parameter here, M prime rather, this one. Uh, it's now been set to zero so that this term becomes one. And then these invariants are primed such that they also carry this parameter S. So essentially they're the same. It's the trace of the, the, trace of the effective stress where each, you know, plus S times I. Uh, and so this S actually now carries the information about the cohesion of the material. So SO there is the same parameter that from the more coulomb so this so this is our same cohesion cohesion from the more coulomb model um, it turns out that the tangent of phi uh, the tangent of phi is identically equal to mu so the internal friction right so that's the internal friction And so then eta is just a function of essentially the internal friction or the f this phi that you can solve for from the internal friction. And so the reason that this model is useful is that it does include the effect of the second principle stress. Right? And in fact, it has the effect that as, a, as the intermediate principle stress gets larger, then it has a sort of an, a strengthening effect on the rock. Uh, but the reason we like it is because we don't, you know, our, the most common material properties that you're going to have in terms of these plasticity mo models or inelasticity models, failure models, come from the more Coulomb. I mean, that because they're the most u u ubiquitous sort of in use. And so the nice thing about this is a little bit more sophisticated model, but we only need the same parameters, right? The internal friction and the cohesion. And, you know, we don't need any, any additional parameters for this model. And so if you look at, not gonna let me. I guess I can't blow it up and keep them both on the screen. So anyway, this is um, sigma two is a function of sigma one. And these dotted values are real data uh, for some limestones, okay, or a limestone, uh, different values of sigma three. So each, you know, the the white circle, black circle, um, white 
square, black square, or different values of sigma 3. And so then this is plotted in sigma 2 as a function of sigma 1. And the more Coulomb model just would predict these straight lines for different values of sigma 3. Which, you know, it's not an aw you know, these aren't, this is not an awful, I, I mean, fit. I've, I've definitely seen worse, but it's not that good either. And you see by using, you know, this uh, modified laid material, you get a slightly better fit, possibly, to the data. So that's that's nice because again, with with without any additional constitutive, without any additional experiments, essentially, this modified laid criteria gives you a little bit better fit. So remember, I said the other day in class and on Friday, in this class, all we're ever going to use is more Coulomb, okay? Because it's really the, it's the, the simplest one. It's the one we can sort of solve problems by hand or with simple computer programs. Right? Um, how many yield surfaces do you think? You know, so we've talked about a few now: more Coulomb, uh, Hoke Brown, Laid. How, how many do you think there are? How many exist? Lots of good answer. How about infinity, right? I mean, the, the reason these are all given names, they're named after people, right? Typically the people who publish the paper. And, you know, they publish a paper and they show that the data fits a little bit better, right? So you may go out and in your career test some, you know, unique shale that behaves very strangely and you, need, and you can't get any good fit to any data that's out there, so you develop your own. Right? And then you, then you have a constitutive model named after yourself when you publish a paper on it. So, yeah, there's, there's, you know, these are just models, right, that, that people uh, came up with, and, and some of them are useful, right? So, we talked a little bit about this on Friday, but let's re recall, right? So, remember, uh, this is a yield surface for the Bohr-Coulomb model. And, and by the way, just um, 